Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now comes the Finnish uh, talk. I'm a farmer from far north. Also, to make a living, I'm a freelance journalist and uh, some sort of uh, advisor, project worker. And my topic is a little bit misleading because uh, it's start with no-till. Well, that's a topic. But actually, we are in a deep, deep trouble how to measure soil carbon because everybody's talking uh, carbon credit things and nobody seems to agree how we measure this thing we are going to sell or, 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 or generate in our soil. So uh, I will cover all those topics there. No till we have one trial in Finland, which is pretty interesting, I guess, measurement things and then economy things because uh, if you want to measure something accurately and you ask uh, people who had done it previously, you end up uh, going through the roof. The cost of reliable sampling on today's methods, uh, scientific methods, is way too high. So we need to combine agronomic knowledge gathering and also reliable enough carbon measuring and do it together. So that way I hope we can make it happen reliably. Uh, on the right you have our map, there are Scandinavian countries. And uh, on the left we have the same problem as you can read as you have here. So uh, the health status goes down, monoculture, yield level stagnated, and uh, really many disease on, uh, problems comes and environmental status is worse and worse and uh, our media and politicians seem to know it's even worse than it is. But please look at the map on, on right and the arrows there. That's the Baltic Sea and uh, the Gulf of Finland, etc. The more red the color, the more purification, the more problems, the more pollution and vice versa, the green one is a nice one. Well, everybody knows that uh, the only reason is agriculture, not true. I have put there on, on blue squares the things. We have a cattle Finland. It's a partly that, but cattle dominated, grass lays, green covers. And uh, the water quality is very good. That area is full of rivers, but the water quality is good because on those areas, the organic content tends to be higher than in south. And, uh, and, and it's, it's winter cover. Numbers are great, no problem. And opposite, where we go to Helsinki, archipelago, uh, Estonia, Poland, and then we have our dear neighbors on east, Russia. They are the bad makers even here, not only what we read uh, on papers lately. They are polluting real big way. And uh, they have the alternative truth there as well. Uh, they have a big gypsum mining site on uh, close to this uh, Gulf of Finland near St. Petersburg. And they need to report every year how much uh, Phosphorus and stuff goes, goes to the river and finally to the Gulf of Finland, and numbers were great. Then one guy from Finland went and took a rowing boat and took a samples, not upstream, but downstream from the plant, and the numbers skyrocketed. They were so clever, they took the samples upstream, so the pollution was not included in the samples, and numbers were right. So, so this is a typical way our dear friends work on that, that side. But anyway, the main point is that green cover, silage, maybe grazing a bit, ruminant agriculture is filtering very well these nutrition and they stay where they should stay and they don't go to rivers or, or sea waters. This is a few year old uh, measurement. It's not based on satellite. It's based around 200 real-time measurements uh, taken by our water authorities. 
uh, around the Baltic Rim, not only in Finland. So that's a situation which uh, is uh, telling something about rich and ag. Now comes to uh, the part which we did together with uh, Simon Cowell here. Uh, maybe I should say that uh, thanks to Englishmen, I'm here. Thanks to Englishmen, uh, I also uh, know a little bit more about uh, Rick and Ack than I, I would have known otherwise. I had a privilege to know many persons, Neil Fuller, Simon Cobble, of course, here, Kevin Asford, uh, Nanda Robinson, and, and, and many others uh, who actually led us to the same road what we are seeing here today in, in, in Crownsville. Jill Clapperton, Christine Jones, they visited Finland thanks to Cherry Brothers, who are organizers here. So I'm very thankful to be able to visit here. So this is our little uh, trial, or not trial, but the setup. Uh, Simon's farm is on left, and uh, my buddy's farm is on right. And we tried to uh, figure out and show up how no-till can benefit soil quality and things. Uh, those maps are rain, amount of rain, precipitation. Uh, it's very dry on the place where uh, uh, southeast Simon is farming and quite dry also on, on downside of that uh, red line. So both of those areas are very um, drought prone over the hottest month uh, of summer. So basically not that good situation. Uh, maybe Simon can comment, but the Motz farm here has shown over way over 10 years that soil organic matter can get up slowly. Uh, and also together with soil organic matter, you see the cation exchange numbers. They go up because humus is holding nutrients. This is self clear, very nice data based on, on numerous uh, 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 samples. And in Finland, we are not that advanced yet to figure out uh, the uh, carbon content. Uh, it's obligatory if we want to do loss of ignition or some other uh, uh, carbon measurement when we do our EU soil sampling. So we only so far have taken the visual samples, but it is generally known that the soil organic matter raises up slowly, but, but steadily if you know till, for example, in this case. And then comes those Leverstoke laboratory samples, the l down row. Simon's farm is left, the Finnish comparative is in middle, and my is on right, and my numbers are worse, because at that field I was intensively working the soil, that was a potato ground. And, and basically, uh, the more to the right, the nice blue colors go, the better it is. And, and then there's one exception. Uh, Simon has been using compost, and others not. And if you look closely, the fungal, bacteria fungal ratio goes nicely towards fungal dominance when you use compost, and it's in numbers there. Well, we have a trial field together with our magazine where I'm working as a freelancer and also the local school. It's located uh, southwest, clay area, and we are testing basically uh, no-till versus inversion. So there are pictures of those techniques. Uh, none of the machines of those pictures are here today because uh, these newest uh, no-till techniques are advanced compared to what we see in the picture. There's Kraus, there's Wedestad, and a Finnish no-till machine. Inversion is placed either for plowing or shallow cultivation plus regular old-timer compi drill. The area is uh, inside that red dotted lines, and it has stayed now the same for uh, actually 17th year starting. So it's half hectare plots, and they stayed at the same place uh, year after year. We've been using the best available measuring technique, which is uh, 
all kinds of monitoring on site. We have uh, drainage wells with sensors to figure out nitrate and phosphate uh, and uh, turbidity. Uh, not all of these years, but started. Satellites, drones, and different scanners. And rotation has been good to be uh, conventional. So it means every year different group of, of plants, but not really the second or third step reckon because uh, only one time we have had three year period with uh, cover crop mix and it really shows up in results but otherwise we haven't been yet able to include uh, cover crops under zone whatsoever we can do today but that will come. Here is the results of the 16 years. If you look at the line, the black line in the middle, it's 100. Every year, the average yield over all the plots, they are 14 together, it's 100. And the red line is the no-till. And everybody else is basically some inversion or min-till. And uh, if you look at here, you can see the rainfall on top. It's a blue area when May, June is very moist and opposite yellow when the May, June is very dry. So the kind of end of the, end of the um, uh, bracket, either too wet or, or, or too, too dry. And always when you get these extreme things, uh, weather happenings, no deal has been the best, always. We have been very level uh, for first years, nothing really happened, but then from that on, this is very uh, uh, well seen. We have a few mistakes we need to admit. There are two points, there is uh, 2016 and 17 when we uh, didn't succeed, but those results are there. Other year, we got a really good yield. 2017, but the farmer who is uh, taking care of the place uh, had in trouble because it was extremely moist autumn and we just didn't get to combine it. If we had, the red line would have been top because that was a super yield, but it, it was just unlucky, very low. And one year we didn't handle the sowing depth. That was 2016. We had a plain, simple problems getting the seeding depth as it should. Had we had that kind of technique we see on, on the field today, we would have easily done it, but that, that technique that time couldn't handle it. It was also by, by the mistake we always do. If we had those taken away, it would have been nearly 20% plus for no-till compared to inversion over 16, 17 years. And uh, so we, we are pretty convinced that if drought is a problem, we have a solution. Number one is no-till, and then you go further to more reckon, re, re, rich and act uh, ways, cover crops, etc. Well, we've been monitoring the organic content in soil. Those maps come from very thick soil scanner, which we are using. On the right hand, you see the zones. And uh, you remember the big square plot is no-till and it, there's a lot of variation. That is not man-made. That's a geological or natural or historical. Uh, then there is a written plow plot on right hand side of the area. That is man-made. When it rains, tries a bit, you go and walk there, you start uh, adding up your height because uh, clay is sticking your, your, your boots. It's totally man-made and visible. And, uh, and the important thing is that uh, when we are measuring down to one meter or 90 centimeter, we can actually see the difference also in deeper horizons, down to one meter, which is, I think, pretty important. And now we run into the problem because our official research only counts zero to 15 centimeters. And we think that we should go to the whole rooting depth. And uh, so 
we farmers can talk with our scientists because uh, they are not on the same page fully. Many are, some are not. And uh, I just pinpoint the red square there that the difference is quite big. Uh, now we run to the next issue. We want to trade carbon, not soil organic matter, not percentage. So uh, we need to have a coefficient to get the uh, kilogram per hectare carbon. Nobody has said how we measure that. Because now we need to know the bulk volume, the, the weight of the known volume sample. None of the uh, uh, testing protocols today, based on EU, and thanks to you, you are Brexit people, I don't think you have it either. So we just do measure something, but we don't really know what are we measuring. Well, this comes from the same field, and uh, if we look at the right, all those intact cores, they are nine, uh, 45 millimeter, 1000 millimeter intact cores. They are all from the same field, this trial field. And uh, so what is, uh, what is the real carbon amount in that area? It's very hard to tell. And on, on left, we have uh, the graphics to say that uh, on the x axel the lesser amount we want to detect, the more samples we need to take to make it proof. And if there's even variation, like the different colors, green, blue, yellow, say, if the variation is big or normal, may, may we say, we may need to have up to 150 reference samples per hectare to be safe if we start to talk about uh, carbon trade and selling uh, things. So very demanding. And then you need to go down to full rooting depth. Uh, if you look at the intact cores, the left one, this is not statistically uh, viable yet. The left core is from the plot where we had a three-year row, six-way mix cover crop, nothing else. Just let it grow. Some deep rooters included. And on the right side, we have a plow, where we have a plow pan, unroti un uncompost rotting uh, straw, uh, limiting uh, gas exchanges, limiting water infiltration, uh, doing nasty things. And if you look at the little, little scores, they are the organic content percentages. This is not statistically proven but uh, uh, we see this happening all the time. They are just examples. And if you take those as a end results, there's a huge difference. So uh, deep rooting, no inversion, surely works. And uh, we try to adapt this principle to our everyday work, or not every day, we only scan at, at, at spring, and uh, more at autumn. So we have a scanner behind, so it has a regular NIR, soil organic content estimate, pH, and EC down to one meter, two layers. It's a pretty nice tool, actually. And in front, we have a reference sampler. And uh, uh, trying to do something accurate, we think that we need to take the reference samples from AP lines, RTK accuracy, and uh, so that we can return to the same place whenever we want. Uh, and uh, not perfect, but uh, if you look at the number on the left side, 150 reference samples, well, the sum referencing the NIR out of Veristec is 400 samples per hectare, but only about 10, 50, maybe 10 centimeter average pitch, because the sensor goes on top only. So the next generation will take all this down to deeper, but it doesn't exist uh, on an affordable form yet, but I'm sure it will come. So the red thing says that uh, I hope we could agree how we take the samples, how we treat them, how, what is the laboratory protocol. Rotanstedt yesterday said that they have, they have uh, thrown away the loss of ignition totally 
they only use the, the dry combustion, which gives a more accurate carbon number, excuse me, soil organic matter number, and then they convert it to the carbon. Loss of ignition is inaccurate if you have a clay with crystallized water, so it doesn't go away the right way. Uh, Combustion is very difficult because the sample is so little. You have a 10,000 square meter, one hectare, you only take a gram or two gram, and that's a number. So you, you need to figure out how to do that nicely. Well, we, this is just conclusion what we've been doing later uh, this uh, 2019 and even, even up to today, but these numbers are only 2019. On the left, we have an official truth by our national research. The blue columns are the kilogram carbon and how much carbon there is in, in, in soil, uh, uh, gram per kilogram of, of soil. On the right side are our measurements. Number one is noted, number two is plow culture, number three is uh, general uh, uh, grass lays all over we've taken them. Number four is our, our super accumulator. I will show the picture after this. And number five is all our measurement together, including organic soils. Number one to four are mineral soils. And number six is intensive agriculture on light, light, light sandy soils. Uh, peats, peats, potatoes, carrots, etc. And uh, we have not one column, the blue one, we have dark blue and brown because we think we need to go down to one meter. And so we have a lot of more carbon in the soil than our official research actually tells. So I figure out that we, we, we are going about to the right road. Well, uh, here are the superstars. The number four, the rotational grazers, these herefores are exactly on that field where we took the samples. It's only one sample, but it's mineral soil. It's, it's really built up organic matter. And if you look at those little uh, uh, numbers uh, down, there are one, two, three, and four. And the fourth one, the fourth column, previous slide, it is the numbers how much the rooting can really generate. That individual farm has been in ECHO uh, over about 25 years. It has been uh, over 10 years uh, totally without plow, continuous uh, renewing of, of, of uh, grass area, 100% 100% grass fed, nothing else, and uh, 40 years without chemicals. So that's a kind of a superstar thing which doesn't exist really. It's a it's a it's a it's a unicorn thing but it can happen. And actually those head efforts grow more grams per day than average intensive uh, confinement feedlot could do, purely on diversity grasses. They have up to 14 variety and, and keep testing all the time the team. So they can prove it works. Uh, actually, I'm putting some things we learned what is important to, to, to make uh, it work really well? It doesn't need to be a topic, what soil quality, no-till, no-till, whatsoever, inversion, blah, blah, blah. But we need to take care that the uh, uh, carbon-nitrogen ratio is optimal. And uh, looks like I have some results coming, and uh, we, we, I have a slide there. Looks like very seldom the carbon nitrogen ratio is optimal for microbial life and, and prosperity. So usually we are nitrogen dominated, especially if we are using biogas reject, slurries, or, or conventional uh, um, uh, liquid or, or conventional granulate fertilizer. We, we mess up with the ratio. And once you get, as you know, too nitrogen dominated, all aerobic microbes breathe out the CO2, and we are even in a situation we lose carbon. Or vice versa, we are too, too carbon dominated, as we know, and the, the growth suffers. Uh, very 
important thing is that we should always only talk about effective rain. So we, we count out the evaporation. Normal weather stations just give you meteorological readings, but we should uh, include the counting of the evaporation uh, based on many, many those uh, humidity, sun energy, um, wind, uh, and temperature. And then the thing is that we need to understand the uh, water potential. We might have a high, high uh, volumetric water table in soil, uh, but it's not the same thing as a plant can utilize the water. The water potential tells how many kilopascal the plant root needs to work to suck the water out from the soil profile. And there is a metering for that already available for our farm weather stations. So uh, we are testing those now. And then understanding the same thing as the Swedish professor said yesterday, was it uh, the last um, presentation in a big tent? He said that the future is for uh, not annuals, but perennials. So we need to lengthen the uh, photosynthetic ac active period as long as possible. It's always a, a good thing for many. And we have actually capability to measure all those. Something will go forward and something we already have. Uh, there is a name of the uh, eddy covariance. That's a meteorological IPCC, IPCC uh, network over the globe. It's really fine. It, we need to have it. But it has nothing to do with practical agriculture, even that research might use it because they don't have any better. So uh, eddy covariance is mixing up everything so that if you have management trials, they need to be 10 hectare apiece <laughs> or five hectare apiece to make it accurate because it's simply a meteorological thing, not, not really agronomical. It, it only has one sensor up there and boo boo, it's all mixed up and uh, you need to have a very good scientific educated people to clean out the mess out of the raw data. Little unpolitely said, but that's the truth. And this is what we try to uh, adapt on that uh, no-till uh, inversion trial site. So we are playing with uh, those weather stations. And uh, instead of uh, thinking about the eddy covariance, it costs a lot. We are implementing a farmer eddy, which means that we have three CO2 meters. One down, really, ambient. One uh, on the flat leaf uh, height, and the third one is three times the height of the vegetation, which is the eddy, eddy height. And uh, I don't know if we ever get that done, but uh, hopefully, hopefully we can, because this is the second serious year when we are trying to implement this kind of uh, measurement technique. Uh, then we have uh, those uh, flux chambers, and it has really shown interesting things. The accumulation or photosynthesis can stop in the middle of the day if plant thinks it's no good now. In Finnish conditions, there might be a photosynthesis happening in the middle of the night. And often it's, it stops when the heat stress, uh, etc., related things turn in. You can measure it very accurately day after day it may stop even that we think it should be working. They are taking the fiesta like the Spaniards and uh, in wh wherever they do that two hours, exactly the same thing. Uh, it would be nice to have the FTER analyzer. Uh, it's a finished product, very expensive. It can do it all. It measures every single volatile gas if it only has two elements. So. It needs to be not pure nitrogen, uh, but if you have two elements, NO, uh, whatsoever, methane, laughing gas, CO2, uh, uh, ammonia, a lot of things. And then that would be a super tool, but it's too expensive. We just tried it. There are drainage wells. We, we try to measure not, not from each plot, but we try to measure what runs out. And we know already that inversion leads you to the road where you are losing both sediment, turbidity, 
phosphorus to ketovich sediment and nitrogen. So uh, even there, the covers work well. Then we have the scanner thing. Uh, Micropyometer, we, we, we see on that uh, exhibition tent somewhere. They have a stand there. A very nice tool, and I have found out that to be quite reliable. Jill Clapperton has introduced many farmers to better life, and uh, she gave the hint that the micropyometer.com is a very handy tool, not expensive, and you can define bacteria fungi uh, relation on site. Not expensive, doesn't give any, any names for microbes, of course not, but it gives you the ratio of how much bacteria or fungi you have in your sample. And it's totally reliable, I think. If you fertilize too much, the bacteria will jump, and vice versa. Uh, then Solvita, health suit you know, and, and our, uh, our latest is the uh, German Stenon Savel, because farmers, and I included, we love nutrition maps. And so far we haven't talked about nutrition, but the, the Stenon gives you on-site, takes one road up to cloud and back, and you have it on your phone immediately. You get the nitrogen, uh, nitrogen, uh, nitrate, ammonia, ammonium, excuse me, phosphorus, uh, potassium, magnesium, pH, uh, some other measurements immediately, and you can make map out of that. So it's kind of a handy, and because that is a leased product, it's not bought. So once you pay the monthly payment, you can take so many samples you want. And you can go to the spot where you know or you doubt you have a problem. And already now, just a couple of months experience, we can spot on that if you have a formation or the topography of the, the soil so that you get waterlogged areas, you immediately lose all your nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen. Either it goes by, by uh, denitification up to the air, which I think is the case, or, or down. Depends on have you clay or your sandy soil. It tells immediately. It's a, it's a great agronomic tool. and uh, uh, doesn't need to be pinpoint accurate, but accurate enough. So that is one. And just this morning I visited the uh, Niap site, a uh, couple of hundred meters that way, and they are developing similar type of on-site analyzers. So there's a lot of interesting things happening all the time. And finally, the conclusions. Very, uh, very familiar story. So economically viable, can increase some for sure. Yield levels, if they don't rise, they still at least the same. Environmental emissions go down for sure. We have even me measured uh, laughing gas out of no-till and out from plow culture. And guess what? The plow culture wins with a big margin, even that somebody say opposite. So I'm ki kind of doubtful to believe uh, too easily what somebody has said. Uh, we, we need to ask everybody, ourselves included, are you sure? And often it turns out that uh, there are many right answers. And then uh, no-till has increased resilience, as we said already, we know it. And in Nordic conditions, we need to take care of certain things. We are also, uh, we are also uh, doing it wrong. We don't control the, the um, when we are combining, we are not controlling the spreading of the straw, the cutting height, height, excuse me, etc. And we can easily also, uh, do the noting in the way that it is not working as we think. And then we need to think what's wrong, and it, it's fully possible, of course. And very important, the last the red one there, is that uh, everybody seems to know outside agriculture that we are guilty for something, especially a topic is uh, the organic soils, the turf and, and high organic soils. Uh, I'm on the opposite side, I don't believe that at all. We have measurements of this. They are very uh, good uh, producers on, 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 uh, on dry years especially. And the last sentence is that it's a management, not a topical method, which 
actually includes uh, how the environmental emissions happen or doesn't happen. So thank you. This is my presentation. I don't know how I, much we have time left, but uh, yeah, yeah. But this this is okay with me. Yeah, of course. If if any questions or comments. Interested in your uh, stenon soil sampler, will, will that read carbon out as well? Yes, uh, the, the carbon. If you if you talk very thick, the the carbon is uh, it's a, it's a proximal sensor, so you need to take the samples to the lab, and that's why when we are driving on the field, we look live the parameters. They they are in the cap in on screen, so it's very important, and you. Um, take the right places, representative places uh, uh, on the field where you take your samples, because otherwise you may go all wrong. You, you need to take the far ends of things, and if you are uncertain, it's statistically pretty well uh, kind of uh, controlled. You get all kind of red lights if everything is not okay. So you, you, you need to increase the four reference sample per partial is minimum. And if you want to do it good, the field is big, you, you go up to something else. So it, it's totally, it, it's a proximal sensor. So it's, it's not direct reading. And uh, it, it uses two wavelengths, the, the typical NIR, which is something 940 or nanometers, but then it also has a, a red 670 nanometer band, and uh, the processing goes to the cloud or to the very stick boys, and then we talk. And, and uh, uh, so actually, there's a little bit also kind of a manual figuring out uh, to make sure that uh, results are reliable. We, we are pretty happy on that, but. I wouldn't start doing carbon trade based on four reference samples, even that we go to the same place because we are RTK. So uh, I'm really looking for uh, rules how to do it. And uh, the Stenon also measures carbon, this German thing. And then usually we take one sample per hectare or, or two samples per hectare. So this is a big uh, development phase now, and nobody really says how we should do it. So. That's kind of a tricky, yeah, yeah. Hi, hey. um, oh, sorry, <laughs> that was quite close. Um, I'm doing a PhD on sort of simple spectral devices uh -huh. and, and how they can be used and whether they can be good. So it might be quite nice to come and chat afterwards Great. about all of that. I was just wondering, the, the device that goes along behind the tractor, is that, a move, do you take scans while you move, or is it sort of you stop and is that it's a scanning on the go. device as well? They have both models, and this is on the go. So you keep driving continuously. Uh, you can decide which spout width you will have. We usually use 12 meters. Uh, I don't know, maybe could be more or less. 12 is okay. And it takes all meterings on the go. So it will take about 50 pH samples. It's a scoop which goes down, up, down, up. And the easy is continuously going for two depth. So it's uh, quite a many, some hundreds. And also the NIR, which is one piece going down there uh, about this depth, is about 400 readings per, per, per hectare. Okay. Ah. The, um, you referred to the photograph of the Herefords and the uh, high oh, soil yeah, organic yeah. matter. Um, you referred to rotational grazing. I was interested to know if um, whether you're eating a third, leaving the third. Oh yeah, uh, this is not, these are not treading. my cows, these are my, my friend's cows. And uh, they are very careful. They are at, at high time, they are changing the, the grazing area 
twice a day. They are counting the, the contact pressure of the cow, sort of, so that they are very careful not uh, going, uh, we have moist autumns often, so they, they, they need to figure out when the soil moisture start to go to to too high or moist, then they, they need to leave it out. Uh, uh, heifers are the last one who can walk the heavy animals away. And uh, it, it's really continuously, um, it's very intensive. I, I think as intensive as it ever can be if, if you move the, the group twice a day. No, not always, of course not. So, uh, so uh, and, and, and just that uh, they are not eaten down to earth, <laughs> they, they, they need to be. There are these nematode questions, uh, regrow questions, all those. So that, that's a kind of a state of art thing to do, right grazing. I, I'm not a, a, a ruminant grower myself, but I've, I've been following with great interest what they do. And the amazing thing for me has been that uh, without supplements, once you do the recipe, the diversity thing right, they grow. They grow as, just as good as with supplement if then often you are supplementing because your, your fodder is not good enough. And if you take care of that the fodder is good enough, the, the grain or supplement whatsoever is not needed. They get the uh, best daily growth will exceed uh, 1.4 kilogram per day or, or 1.6, something like that. It's just crazy how, how well they can grow. It's a pedigree animal, so it's a whole thing, of course. Yeah. Okay.